I'd like to thank you all for coming. I mean, this is obviously a very, very important topic, and especially for your businesses. And so um, a lot of you were able to come to our seminar back in November and um, meet Mr. Haynes and um, see him speak then. But we wanted to bring you back in and give you the opportunity to ask questions that maybe pertain a little bit more to your size of business, um, and especially the industry in Branson being so seasonal and that type of thing. So he's got some slides to go through, um, but also this is pretty informal. Um, we want you to be able to ask questions, and um, hopefully he'll get a chance to play his guitar a little bit too. And, and um, so I'll just turn it over to uh, Andrew Haynes. He's out of Kansas City, a benefits attorney, and uh, we're going to make stuff. Very good. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I'm going to hit on two topics today. When we were talking about what to do, is when I was here in November, the topics I went over were extremely broad. I kind of tried to do a top to bottom review of healthcare reform and all the pieces. And today we're really going to focus in on the two most popular topics for employers in the mid to smaller large size. And that's really what we're going to hone in on. Now, as we get to the Q&A part, if you've got other things you want to ask me about, that's fine. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. I will tell you uh, in kind of just a precursor follow-up to what I talked about in November, everything I told you then you can pretty much forget because it's all old. Um, it's just phenomenal how fast these rules are changing. Last week alone, we got three major sets of new rules. Just last week alone. Um, I think when I was here in November, I told you we were averaging about 300 pages of new regs a week. This past month, we've been averaging over 500 pages of new regs a week. And um, if you see bags under my eyes and if I look really tired and disheveled, you know why. Um, it's been phenomenal. We're getting so much new out of Washington. Uh, you know, again, when I was here in November, we were, you know, right around election time. And surprisingly, the regs really slowed down right before the election. And I knew that they were going to be hitting hard once the election was over because a lot of things in the regs were political, or at least politically sensitive, and they didn't want them to become election issues. So since the election, we've been getting pummeled uh, with these regs, and the area I'm going to be talking about today, we've gotten several sets of regs on. Remember, though, we're just now into March, and the effective dates for what I'm going to be talking about are mostly in October and January. So don't take what I say today to be the very last word. There will be changes between now and then. It's really critical to stay up on this. Are they going to overturn what I've talked about today? No, probably not. They're more likely going to be continuing to tweak it. As we go through this, you'll see some areas where it's very clear already that there are problems. And there are things that uh, you'll see just lead to a lot of confusion. So that's one precursor. Um, the other precursor is while these two topics I'm talking about today are the ones that are getting the most attention, there are dramatic changes going on in all sorts of areas under health care reform. Um, today, the two topics I'm going to talk about are exchanges, what's going on with exchanges nationally, what's going on locally. The second major topic I'm going to talk about is what we refer to in the industry as pay or play. Uh, this is the topic dealing with, are you providing coverages for your employees? Do they meet up to what the government says they have to be if they're going to be creditable? And if you're not, what kind of penalty will you have to pay? And included in that is, how do you count the number of employees you have? And that's a huge topic right now. So, again, the two topics will be exchanges and pay or play. Why am I talking about exchanges? Because most of you probably aren't going to be on the exchange. Well, they're completely interlinked. The whole concept of pay or play is 
that your employees can leave your plan and go on to the exchange, and when will you have to pay an employee, and when will they get premium tax credits, and all those types of issues. So they're very interlinked. You really cannot understand pay or play without understanding the exchange because it's layered on the exchange. So the other thing, and we were having some conversations getting ready to get started, what I'm going to tell you may be completely different than what you know. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I will blame the election cycle for it because a lot of people running for office either didn't understand the rules they were running against or intentionally misstated them on both sides of the aisle. If you remember from November, I trash both parties equally. Um, I, I, you will not un know my politics when you get to the end of this. That's not, you're not hiring me for a political speech. You're coming in to hear me talk about what's going on in the industry, not in politics. So with that, go ahead and get started. Again, the two topics I'm going to hit on are exchanges and pay or play. The exchanges part of the discussion um, is going to be laying out what's in place now, what can we expect for January 1, what do we expect down the road. The pay or play will be things that you need to be doing now. Now again, these rules may be tweaked, but we've got a pretty good idea of where these rules are going to be going now. So let's start with the exchanges. The basics of the exchanges. Number one, what is an exchange? And President Obama, when he was pushing for the exchanges back several years ago, seems like a lifetime ago to me now, but several years ago, referred to them as Travelocity for Insurance. And uh, one of my friends that also does a lot of speaking in the area, and he's from the southeast, says, eh, I don't think it's really Travelocity Insurance, it's more like TurboTax for insurance. But Travelocity, you know, if you want a flight from Springfield to Chicago, you plug in the location, Springfield, Chicago, you plug in the date you want to go, you know, do you want to go in the morning or evening, how long do you want to be gone? So you plug in all these facts and then Travelocity gives you the eight airlines that can get you there, well maybe not out of Springfield, the three or four airlines that can get you there, what the different prices are, kind of apples to apples. That at its core is what the exchange is supposed to be. I mean the exchanges are inordinately complicated in their structure and operation, but at their base it's a website. It's just a website. You know from the consumer standpoint they will be able to go on to this website, put in their age, maybe their spouse's age, their kids' ages, and there are going to be about six or seven different plan offerings. There's platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. There are going to be other types of offerings like child only and individual policies. And they pick the policy they want. They pick their ages. They put in their geographic <coughs> area that they're in Branson or Hollister. And they hit the enter key. And within a little bit of time, there will be the four carriers that are willing to provide them a bronze level policy in Branson for them, their wife, and their two kids. That's, from a consumer standpoint, that's all the exchange is. From our standpoint, it's a lot deeper than that. Now, the exchanges are set to start in 2014, maybe. Statutorily, they're set to start in 2014. Those of us who are watching what's going on have serious doubts as to whether they're going to make those deadlines. One of the most recent rumors we've heard out of Washington is that the exchanges might be up and running in 2014 for individuals but not for groups, that the group part of it might be delayed. That's just a rumor. Uh, but we will see about all that. But A number of employers, a number of consumers, a number of those in the industry had a couple of reasons they were delaying complying with health care reform. First off, a lot of people thought, well, I'm not going to do anything until we see how the Supreme Court rules. 
you know, the Supreme Court ruled that last summer and upheld health care reform. And I thought, okay, well, now I'm not going to do anything until we see how the election goes. And some of those people were hoping Romney would win and they wouldn't have to comply. And, of course, Obama won and PPACA and health care reform were continuing on. Well, it wasn't just the private sector doing that. It was a lot of governmental entities doing the same thing. Not at the national level. National level was moving on. But a lot of the states were saying, we're going to see how the Supreme Court rules. And when that didn't go, they said, well, we're going to see how the election goes. So a lot of the implementation, particularly with the exchanges, has been very slowed down. The states are today, if they were going to do this right, if they wanted to set up their exchange and were going to do it right, they are today where they should have been a year ago. And so a lot of these are going to have a hard time getting established. I'll go into that more later. Now, a couple of states already have exchanges. Um, we'll go into some examples of those. Not many, but a couple do. Um, uh, Massachusetts, Utah, California, a few others. State progress differs. Some states are refusing to do anything. Others are doing different versions. We'll go into that. And then we have the federal blueprint as to what will be happening on the federal level. Will the federal exchange be ready? This is a quote from Alan Cohen, who is at HHS, and he is responsible for the setting up of the federal exchanges. And he said, yes, we will be ready. Now, it's easy for me to say that, right? We've been saying it, but we're now eight months away, so it's time for us to start showing it. This came out in January, just a little over a month ago now. Does that make you feel really secure about it? It's not exactly the most... Of course we are. We're already there. Now, I will point out, if you really want to follow this stuff, there are two websites. Uh, one's called The Hill, and one's called Politico, P-O-L-I-T-I-C-O. -I -I uh, the Hill tends to be more Republican. Politico tends to be a little more Democrat. Um, they each have a health care blog. And they're really good places to get information on what's going on politically with all of this. But Gary Cohen is a super key figure in all of this taking place. The structure of the exchanges. There are three types of exchanges that will be happening on the national level. The first type is a state-based exchange. When healthcare reform was established, the idea and the goal, really, was that the states would be setting up their own exchanges. And they assumed most states would do this. PPACA, and again, that's Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, which people now call, uh, at least the White House calls it Affordable Care Act, or ACA. I still say PPACA because that's what we started saying in 2010, and it's hard for me to get away from it. But... It was really based on the assumption that 40 of the 50 states would choose to do their own exchange and that there wouldn't be much left beyond that. Now, one of the things that drove me crazy during the election was hearing candidates say, this state will not have an exchange. That is completely wrong no matter what state you're talking about. Under this system, every state will have an exchange. The issue is who will be running that exchange. The state gets first choice. The state can say, we're going to run our own <coughs> exchange. And if they do, the federal government stays out of it. If the state says we're not going to, then the state will have what's called a federally facilitated exchange. And the federally facilitated exchange is run by the federal government, and I'll get into this in more detail as to how they're doing it. So if the state refuses, then the feds will come in and run that exchange in that state. And I will talk about what's going to happen here locally in a moment. The third option is what we refer to as a state partnership exchange. 
And this we're starting to see a little more of. And what's happening here is some of these states have, again, been lagging behind. They're not up and running. They're not going to be ready to have this for January. And they're saying, we'd like to be involved, but we can't do all of it. And so the state will do some of the consumer parts of it in terms of being the front piece for the exchange. But behind it, the federal government will actually be running the mechanics. I kind of refer to it as the state will run the retail store and the federal government will run the warehouse. That, see what I'm saying then? So the state will give the image of actually doing it, but it's actually going to be run and operated by the federal government. Those are the three main types, and I'm going to go into them in detail how each of those will look. Now, there's also something out there called a private exchange. Deborah, are you seeing many of these running down here yet? Okay. Private exchanges are really just a new label on an old concept. They're what we used to call defined contribution plans. And defined contribution plan meant the employer, through one mechanism or another, goes to all the employees and says, here's 400 bucks per month. Here's a website. Go buy your coverage. And it's like a defined contribution, meaning I'm defining the contribution. For this year, it's going to be 400 a month. Next year, it'll be 420, whatever. Here's a website that's set up by our broker or whomever. Go buy your coverage. That's been around for quite a while. It's more popular in some parts of the country than others. All that has happened is they're taking that old concept and putting this word exchange on it. And basically, they're just kind of opting in to all the marketing that's going on for exchanges. And so putting, a, as I said, new label on old product. One other thing about exchanges, there are two types of exchanges, active and passive. An active exchange means, and I'm going to just refer to states first, the state will actually negotiate the rates that the carriers can charge They'll be very active in looking at what carriers can sell on the exchange, what they can charge, what their plan designs will look like, and so forth. A passive exchange is an exchange where the state, all it does is set up the web portal. And they'll look and say, any carrier that can offer the products that are designed under the health care form can put them on here. You can charge whatever you want. And we'll let the market decide. You know, whoever's cheapest will probably get the most business. But we're not going to regulate the rates. Of the exchanges that are already running, California is an example of an active exchange. It's a very active exchange. And they only let in a small percentage of the carriers that want to be there. The passive exchange, an example of that is Utah. Uh, Utah's had a passive exchange in place for several years. All right, what are the functions of an exchange? Number one, they will certify and decertify uh, qualifying health plans. QHPs are qualifying health plans. The only plans that can be sold in the exchange are QHPs. The design of those QHPs is set out by statute. If you owned a carrier and you thought, man, I've got a lot better plan than anything being sold on the exchange right now, I want to put it on there. You can't. Because the only things that can be put on are those that are authorized by statute. So if you've got a lot better plan than what's on the exchange, you have to sell it outside the exchange. You can only sell on the exchange qualifying health plans. Number two is quality and price rating. Um, if the exchange wants, they can do the rating and the... Uh, uh, the premium, standardized consumer information. Um, one of the big ideas of PPACA is the concept of uniformity. And so all the information, no matter who the carrier is, there will be standard information about the products and the carriers offer those different products. There's an electronic calculator, and as we go through the morning, you'll see the types of things that are in that calculator. In other words, 
what's my premium going to be, you know, am I going to get a premium subsidy, am I going to get a tax credit, and all those things. Is my coverage affordable? Uh, it'll be a website. Uh, the statute also requires for there to be a toll-free call center for those people who are not internet savvy. So it has to be both internet and toll-free, and I guess we can all figure out who wouldn't be uh, internet savvy, you know, or grandparents or whatever. Eligibility, the exchange will uh, determine eligibility, and it will also determine if the individual signing up for the coverage is entitled to one of the incentives. And then this concept called the navigator. And the navigator is very politically sensitive. If you have a question about the exchange, you can talk to a navigator. The navigator does those things that a broker does, but is not a broker. The navigator um, is either a nonprofit or similar entity that has relationships with employers and employees, that has training and licensing as a navigator, not a broker, that has no conflict of interest, meaning they don't work for a carrier, because, you know, Blue Cross could put people on there and they would all shift them trying to get them over to Blue Cross as a concept. And they must have cultural and linguistic competency, uh, meaning be able to speak the four languages required under the statute. So if somebody calls in speaking Spanish, there will be somebody that can speak Spanish with them. The navigators can come from one of four different industries, unions, professional associations like SHRM, perhaps, Human Resource Management. They cannot work for an insurer, and um, they can be agents and brokers, but the navigators have to include people other than agents and brokers. Now, the NAIC, which is National Association of Insurance Commissioners, came out with a very, very strong statement against navigators and said in our states, and now these are the insurance commissioners in all 50 states, they said what we do at the state is license brokers. Why would we not want to have licensed brokers doing what they do? Why do we want to have people who don't have a license selling insurance? So the NAIC came out very strong against the navigator concept, saying that basically we have all these professionals in the state, and what healthcare reform is requiring us to do is now hire amateurs to take the place of the professionals. So that's a very hot button political topic. We'll see how it plays out. Who will be covered under the exchanges? Individuals and small employers in 2014? Maybe. Maybe. Again, I don't know that that's actually going to, uh, I, I just don't know that the machinery's there to get it all done by then. Maybe it is. And we stay in touch with a lot of people in Washington. The state will have the option to expand that to include the large employer market in 2017. Now, currently there is a federal plan in place called PSIP which stands for Pre-Existing Condition Insurance Plan. This is not a new concept. A lot of states have something very similar to PSIP called a high-risk pool. These are folks who cannot get covered by a carrier because they are so sick. At the federal level, these are people who have a pre-existing condition. They're over the age of 19 because the current rule is anyone under 19 can't be ruled out for a pre-existing condition. And they can't get coverage anywhere else, so they are in this pool called PSIP. And it's actually administered here in the, in the state of Missouri. In 20, on 12-31-2013, PSIP ends. So those PSIP enrollees on 1-1 one, one are immediately going to roll over to the exchange. So the first group of thousands of people that will be going on to the exchanges are these PSIP folks who are incredibly bad risk. They're risk that can't get covered anywhere else. So the first people in the exchange 
are going to be very expensive. Now, who else do we expect to be the first in line? Other individuals kind of in a similar situation. There's great concern that these exchanges are going to be so what we call adversely selected against that they're going to become unaffordable. Uh, again, the eligibility will be determined by the exchange as to who can be in there. The second part will be the small employers called shop exchanges. Now, in the second part of what I'm talking about, I'm going to tell you a small employer is 49 or less. For purposes of the exchange, small employer is less than 100. Often in my seminars, people say, what's the definition of small employer? And I say, it depends on what rule you want to know about. There are three different definitions of small employer in PPACA. One's at 25, one's at 50, and one's at 100. So anyway, for this purpose, it's 100 unless the state says 50. The goal is to bring small employers together so that they can increase their buying power. If the small employer is in the exchange, they have to offer it to all full-time employees, and we're going to define that in a little while. <coughs> the employer has to make a disclosure to their employees uh, it applies to all the employers that are subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is most employers. They'll have to make this disclosure to both current and new hires, and in that disclosure they'll talk about the, and it's a kind of a required disclosure, the consequences of being in the exchange versus the consequences of being in the employer plan. Enrollment. See, now I keep saying that the exchange is going to be up and running 1114. That's actually a little bit wrong because enrollment for the exchange under the statute has to start October 1 of 2013. It's only eight months away. I mean, we are really closing in on that date. There will be three types of enrollment. The initial enrollment, which is 10-113 to 331-14 annual enrollment, which means once they're in and they renew, um, and there will be a 32-day, 30, that's really weird, but that's what's in there, annual enrollment period. And then there's special enrollees, much like you currently have. If somebody is on your plan and it's husband, wife, and one kid and they have another baby, the baby's a special enrollee and can come on the plan even though it's not open enrollment. You know what I'm talking about there, right? Okay. Same kinds of things going on at the federal level on the exchange. Andrew, on those yeah. On those enrollment, though, who, who exactly are you talking about? State, local, federal, local, local, local. Who's enrolling? It's really going to be the exchange itself. And I'll be getting into it when I look at the state exchanges and the federal exchanges and so forth. But the exchange itself is in charge of eligibility, not the carrier. Uh, they don't, quite frankly, they don't trust the carriers. So the, the government will be actually running the eligibility with the concept of if the government does it, there'll be more eligibility than there would be if the carrier is trying to weed out some bad risk. So this is a governmental function. And again, in some states that'll be the state, in some states that'll be the federal government doing it. Um, the state-based exchanges. The exchange can either be a governmental or a non-profit entity. In all the states that are doing it, it's, it's pretty much a governmental entity. Um, you know, non-profit entity, if it had this, it's kind of like the navigator. You know, a navigator is somebody who's got the tools, supposedly, to do all this, but isn't a professional broker. I mean, I'm like, you know, who... Who signs people up for insurance as a hobby? You know, that's, I mean, where are they going to find these people to be navigators? So it's kind of like this. Okay, what nonprofit entity is thinking, hey, I got a great idea. Why don't we set up an exchange? Um, there's flexibility in design. The state has quite a bit of uh, leeway over how they do this. They can be active or passive. There's an approval process if the state wants to do it. The federal government has to approve what they're going to do, and it has to fit within certain guidelines. The exchange will qualify the uh, health plans to be in there. The state has the ability to manage the quality and price of the plan. HHS, which is Health and Human Services, who is the probably the most uh, busy agency in all the government right now, 
They are overseeing most of the health care reform. They are overseeing these exchanges. HHS has come out and said there will be no further extensions of deadlines. They gave a most recent extension to today uh, to hear from the states on certain key items. Um, and they said there will be no further extensions. If the states aren't in now, then the feds are coming in to do it instead of the states. The statute requires that the state exchange be financially self-sustaining by January 1 of 2015. And then the final thing, and this is interesting, and this is going to fit into what I'm talking about on the partnership exchanges. The state, even if they're not ready to go for 14, they can come in at a later year. And what some states are saying is, we don't want to be at the forefront because these things may crash, you know, and they may just fall apart. Now, if we see that other states can do it and that it works out okay, we may decide that we'll set ours up in 2015 or 2016. We just don't want to be the first ones out there doing it. So keep that in mind. It's going to come back with a little different topic here in a moment. Now, this is out of... This is a map of the country with what's going on in the various states regarding their exchanges. Um, there are two other websites I'd tell you about. This one's off commonwealthfund.org, and there's another one called theheritagefoundation.org. Again, they're on the opposite sides of the spectrum. Commonwealth Fund tends to be more liberal. Uh, Heritage Fund is very conservative. They both have terrific information on what's going on with exchanges. This is kind of the uh, most clear map out there of what's going on on a state-by-state -state basis. These brown, dark brown states are the ones that either have or will have a state exchange uh, that they have said they will be up and running by 1-1-14. I'll go through a list here with you. At this point in time, 18 states and the District of Columbia have said they will have an exchange up and running by January. So it's 18 states plus D.C. Some of these are already up and running. Again, California I've already talked about. Utah is in here. Massachusetts is in here. We've got California, which was an active exchange. Um, I can't think of the former governor's name, the governor. What's Schwarzenegger got that one set up. Um, Utah, uh, again, it's more of a Republican concept exchange. It's very passive. Uh, Massachusetts, we all know Romney set up an exchange and then denied that he ever did it kind of thing in the last election or denied that it was a good idea, but his was different, all that. But these are the states that have one up and running or will be up and running by January. Six states are pursuing a state-federal partnership exchange where the state, again, will be the retail store and the federal government will be doing the um, back room work or the warehouse. Um, right here we got Arkansas. We're almost in Arkansas down here in Hollister. So, um, by the way, I was telling some of the Connell folks, uh, we are really close to the land that my great-grandmother owned down here in Hollister. Uh, for my mom's side of the family owned land down here forever and ever and ever. And uh, so it's, it's very interesting for me to be down here and see this change because I came here when I was a little bitty scupper. And I was like, last night I ate at uh, Rocky's. And I realized, I think I was in this restaurant before it was Rocky's, you know, when I was a little kid. I just was sitting there. Thinking, this does look familiar. I think I was here with my Uncle Harold. So. Uh, so anyway, these are states that are going with the partnership exchange. Three states have at least purportedly made no decision. That's not accurate because in Florida, Governor Rick Scott is one of the most vocal opponents of exchanges. We know Florida is not going to do it. Then we've got 23 states. Now again, the most inaccurate thing you can hear about all this is if a state says, we will not have an exchange. Every state will have an exchange. The only question is who's running it. In most of the states, it's going to end up being the federal government because we've got these 23 
we've got these three states, which will make it 26, and then these six states, which makes it 32, where the federal government's going to have some say over what's going on. So any state that doesn't do anything, or even if they say we're not going to do it, the feds will step in. This kicks in if the state is either refuses to act or is slow to act. Let me tell you about our two states here. In Arkansas, as I told you, is going to be a partnership. They're just really interesting politics in Missouri and Kansas. Of course, here in Missouri, you know, we have a Democrat governor and a Republican lieutenant governor. And they don't like each other at all. That's no secret. And Nixon wanted to set up an exchange. Kinder was very against it. What you may not know is that Kinder actually sued Nixon to prohibit him from establishing an exchange. Were you aware of that lawsuit? It's been going on for oh, about a year. Kinder lost. Uh, Nixon won the lawsuit. But on our last presidential ballot in November, remember there was a ballot item related to the exchange? How many remember that item on the ballot? Many of you don't even remember. You just voted on in November whether you want an exchange or not. And the ballot measure was very innocuously worded. It said that the state cannot set up an exchange unless it's approved by the legislature. Is that starting to ring a bell that maybe you did vote on it after all? I mean, it sounds really innocuous, right? Now, it's one of the kind of the genius in whoever wrote it because the deal was the committee that would move that along had agreed it wouldn't hold any meetings on it until it was past the March 1 deadline. So while it sounded just like an, a legislative protocol, that ballot measure killed Nixon's ability to set up a state exchange because the legislature wasn't even going to look at it. You know, we have a Republican governor and basically, a Democrat governor and a Republican legislature. Now, that's all the public information. What we are hearing privately out of Jeff City is that there's still a lot of negotiating going on between the governor's mansion and the legislature. So perhaps it could be, perhaps we could be one of those that comes in later. So we've got a governor and lieutenant governor who don't like each other. <coughs> Kansas has a governor and an insurance commissioner who don't like each other, but the weird thing is they're in the same party. They're both Republicans. Commissioner Prager, who's big in the NAIC, heads up the Exchange Committee. And she's a Republican. Don't forget that. She's a Republican. So she took the federal funds to set up a state exchange. Governor Brownback made her set, send back the funds. She sent them back because he ordered her to, and he's her boss. But she still continues to speak out against her boss, the governor. Now, the interesting thing is here, Brownback says, and this is even the split in the Republican Party, Brownback says, we don't want exchange, we don't want anything to do with the exchange. Prager's position is, we're going to have an exchange. And if we have to have an exchange, would we rather it be run by Kansans or by Washingtonians? Would we rather it be run at the state level? Or would we rather it be run at the federal level? She says, hey, I may not be in favor of the exchange, but if we're going to have to have one, I'd rather it be run out of my department than out of HHS. So all sorts of different theories here. Um, that one's going to be real interesting to see how it plays out. Brownback kind of backed himself in a corner. What's the FFE? The FFE, Federally Facilitated Exchange, will be operating in, as we said, up to 32 states. Um, there'll have to be at least two plans in every state, a multi-state plan and a non-profit plan. The FFE will be overseen by OPM, that's the Office of Personnel Management. OPM has experience running health insurance because OPM oversees the FEHB which is the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan. 
So they insure hundreds of millions, literally millions, under the FEHB. There'll be a 3.5% user fee to pay for OPM services, and there's a board made up of uh, stakeholders, consumers, issuers, providers, and employers. There's an FAQ that came out in December saying that HHS will become familiar with state laws, so that the state complies with, or the feds comply with state laws, and that it's going to do, uh, the, the feds will do the certification, the consumer support, and the state can do the consumer support, sorry. And then the other item is, currently the Departments of Insurance regulate carriers under the exchange. The Department of Insurance will still do that, not the federal government. Finally, the state partnership exchange. I won't go into this a whole lot more. Again, there's a lot of detail to it, but the concept is, again, the state's the retail shop, the feds are the warehouse. I mentioned this before. Some states are looking at this model saying, we're going to do this because we don't think we can be ready to do a full exchange 1-1. So we'll do the part that we're good at which is the stuff that the DOI already does. And we'll let the feds do the other part with the idea that as we go down the road, we can take over what the feds are doing. See what I'm saying? So they start off with a little bit not having to bite off the entire thing. The exchanges will sell qualified health plans that are either by carriers or co-ops. Co-ops are nonprofit health plans. Um, one of the problems, though, in the fiscal cliff bill, they defunded co-ops, so we're not going to see new co-ops. Um, to be a qualified health plan, basically you have to be a licensed carrier. You have to have network adequacy, meaning you have to have enough providers in those areas, and a lot of the same things that you require of a carrier. Now, <coughs> the exchanges are built on the individual mandate. Without this, exchanges would be a disaster because otherwise exchanges are only going to have the sick. The individual mandate is there to put healthy people in it. Now I did this in November, but if you remember I gave you a little pop quiz in November and I said in the 2008 election who supported the mandate? McCain and Clinton supported the mandate and Obama was against it. But the mandate's in there and it's a part of it. The, if, penal, if individuals don't buy the coverage, they have a penalty tax uh, applicable to them. The tax is this amount. It's $95 for 2014 or 300% uh, of $95 for families. The percentage of income, which is 1% in 2014 and increases in 2015, 2016. It's a really minor penalty. One of the interesting things is health care reform requires the IRS to collect these penalties and the IRS doesn't like it. They say, we're a taxing agency. We're not an insurance premium collection agency. So the IRS has really been fighting this. Individuals who buy on the exchange may be entitled, and this is where we're really now starting to get into pay or play, may be entitled to a premium tax credit. If they purchase a qualifying health plan through the exchange, unless they're eligible for other minimum essential coverage, which is employer-sponsored, affordable, and has minimum value or minimum rates. So I'll talk about that more as we get into pay or play, but this is the precursor. So if somebody is working for the employer and goes off and buys on the exchange, they may be entitled to a credit. The opposite side of that is if the individual is entitled to a credit, then the employer is going to pay a penalty. And we'll show you how that works in just a bit. You're not eligible for the tax credit if you're eligible to enroll in an employer plan and you actually enroll in that plan. So your employees who are on your plan will not get the tax credit. And there are a couple exceptions for that that I'm not going to go into. The tax credit is based upon affordability and the premium is deemed to be unaffordable if the employee's cost exceeds 9.5% of household income for the taxable year. We're going to talk about this more under pay or play, but that statement is extremely controversial. And the part that's controversial is this, household income. 
how are you going to know if the premium is more than 9.5% of household income? You would have to find out from your employees, does their spouse work, and how much does their spouse make, and are they moonlighting? What employer wants to know that? None. What employees want to tell you that? None. Right? So as we'll see in the second half, this has become kind of watered down to where you're just looking at the employee's W-2. So it's really not household income anymore. Minimum value. A plan fails to meet the minimum value, and again, we'll talk about this more in the second part, but this is for the premium tax credit. If the plan's share of the total low cost of benefits provided under the plan is less than 60% of such cost. Under the exchange plans, there are four types of plans. Platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. Platinum is a 90% coinsurance. Gold, 80. Silver, 70. Bronze, 60. Okay? So basically, the minimum value means that the employer plan has to be at least a bronze level plan. Okay? That's why I said, in other words, it's a bronze plan. So the premium tax credit will apply if the employer's plan is less than that. Will employers move to exchange? We, we were hearing at some point, some employers saying, hey, I'm glad the federal government's stepping in. I'm tired of doing this. I'm willing to just pay the penalty, throw my employees on the exchange, and I don't have to worry about it. I don't think that's going to happen much. We'll have, you know, will employers move? And I'm going to cover this again at the end. Here's the list. Let me just talk about a couple of things right now. Um, the penalties we'll get to in the second part. Business reasons. If you've got good employees, you want to do what you can to keep good employees. One of them is going to be having better policy than they can get on the exchange. That's part of it. You know, right now we're kind of in an employer's market. It wasn't too long ago we were in an employee's market. And it was hard to find good employees. Um, high value workforce, if you're in a higher industry where you're looking for the best people. All these reasons, I think employers are not going to be overly excited about the exchange. Again, I'm going to come back to these same concepts when we get to the end of our pay or play discussion. A couple of other items. Will the exchanges actually work? That's a huge question. You know, we're not seeing any test runs out there, so this is a huge question. Is the workforce likely to qualify for subsidized coverage? We'll see more about that in a little bit. Or will cost to provide coverage continue to increase and by how much? One of the things we're going to see, and PPACA has this new rule that comes into play that says if a, if a carrier's increase is 10% or more, then HHS says that's unreasonable and we have the right to review it to see if it's reasonable. Is that twisted logic or what? It's unreasonable, and we can determine if it's reasonable. So anyway, one of the things we're seeing right now is a number of carriers are coming out with long-term five-year agreements that they want to go up by more than 9.9%. Is that coming in down here much? Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of that around the country right now. Um, impact on cafeteria plans. If you have a cafeteria plan and you do have your employees go over to the exchange, if you have a CAF plan, but you're having employees buy their policies individually, they cannot use CAF plan funds to do that on a pre-tax basis. If you, as an employer, have a CAF plan, but put them out on the shop exchange, which is the small employer exchange, then you can use CAF funds, funds, CAF funds to do that. So the cafeteria plans can still be in place even after exchange. All right, let's get into this part now, the pay or play. This is where we're really going to have to start doing the math. The question is, will an employer pay or play? There are four questions that we're going to go through, and for each of these there are going to be a lot of sub-issues. But number one, are you a large employer? Are you subject to the pay or play penalties? That's question one. 
Number two, who are your full-time employees? We're going to look at these in order. Number three, what are the penalties? What are the applicable penalties? And then number four, what are your options with respect to those penalties? So what we're going to be doing is determining who's a large employer, who is subject to these various pay or play penalties. Number one, large employer status. Are you subject to the penalties? The definition of a large employer is 50 or more full-time employees. Okay, that's the key number. 50 or more full-time employees taking into account full-time equivalents. Okay? Full-time equivalents. That FTE rule, full-time equivalence, is one of the primary reasons we set this up today. Because so many of you are in industries here in the area related to entertainment and tourism, which are two big targets of these FTE rules. So we're going to go into that in a great bit of detail. Now, as a precursor, if you have less than 50 employees, Less than 50 full-time employees. And remember, full-time means those who are actually full-time plus full-time equivalents. I'll get into the actual numbers here, but for now, just think of it this way. Two 20-hour employees equal one 40-hour employee. Okay? That's what a full-time equivalent is. All right? We'll get into that in more detail. But if you have less than 50 full-time employees, no penalty. No penalty. An employer has a health plan or does not have a health plan, no penalty if less than 50 FTEs, full-time employees. Number two, if you're under 50, you may be able to exclude a class of employees so long as you have less than 50 full-time employees. So you might have you know, a certain class of employees that are covered and class of employees that aren't covered. The key is, do you hit this 50 number? And I keep getting this question. It's 50 or more. So to be a small employer, you have to have 49.5 or less. No, it's actually 49.9. Everything under the statute rounds down. It's not 49.5. It's 49.9 employees. Uh, that's a weird rule, but it all rounds down. So 50 or more. Anything 49 or less is not a large employer. Now, how do you decide that? you have a look-back period. There are going to be three periods that we're going to look at. The look-back period is what we call the measurement period. So we're going to look back, and let's just go into the future now. You look back to the prior year, and you make your calculation. The second period is called the administrative period. And that's the period where after you make your measurement, you have what's in essence kind of an open enrollment. And then the third period is called the stability period. We, these are all in the notes and out in the, in the slides, so you'll have this. The measure, or stability period is a period of coverage. The key here is you make this determination once a year. And during the stability period, that measurement you made stays. So if you're deemed to be a large employer, let's say, and we're in 2014, we look back at 2013, we decide you're a large employer. So for 2014, those people are on your plan, you're subject to pay or play. If you have a massive layoff in April of 14 and you were at 55 and now you're at 20, you're still a large employer because the calculation is made once a year. You with me on that? These are some real critical underpinnings of all of this. The calculation's made once a year. Typically, beyond this year, that calculation, that look back, will be at a 12-month basis. For 2013, the look back is only going to be a six-month look back, and you get to choose the six months. Why is that? 
because the rules didn't come out till January. And HHS decided, well, they came out and it would have actually been the measurement period so you didn't have a chance to adopt your practices to deal with the new rules. So you'll use a six month look back period instead of a 12 month look back period. Okay, you with me? Stop me if I'm losing you already because it's gonna get, this is the easy part folks, I gotta warn you, it's gonna get nasty. Right. So we, we can delay. You can delay. Right. And I'm going to get in. There, there are okay. separate rules for non-calendar year plans. Okay. okay. And with these opening rules, I'm talking about calendar year plans. Because I think like 70, 80%, I think, of employers are calendar year plans. It's kind of the number I keep hearing. All right. Second rule. Any employee who works 30 hours per week or more is a full-time employee. So 75%, okay? So an employee who works 30 hours or more is a full-time employee and counted. And that's an average of, and it's, we'll get into all this, but that's an average of 30. For everyone else, you use the full-time equivalent rule. 120 hours per month average is one full-time equivalent regardless of the number of employees who perform the 120. If you've got 12 employees who work 10 hours a month, those 12 employees are one full-time equivalent. All right, still with me? Kind of looking for signs of life here, you know. All right, because this is gonna get a lot worse. So 120 hours a month, no matter if it's six people working 20, 12 working 10, or if it's two working 60, that's one full-time equivalent. And the full-time equivalent is every bit the same as much of a full-time employee as the one working 30 hours a week. So to determine the large employer status, there are four steps. Step one is Determine the monthly average of full-time employees for the preceding year. And again, for uh, calendar year 2014, you can use six months. Full-time employees, employee who works 30 hours per week or 130 hours per month. I know before I said 120. This is a different rule. This rule was written for 130 instead of 120. So 30 hours a week or 130 hours per month, which is there because a month is 4.2 weeks, okay? So, you calculate the number of full-time employees for each month in the preceding year. You divide the number of full-time employees by 12 to determine the monthly average of full-time employees. And again, in 13, you can use the six-month measurement period. So, you with me on that? You're going to Determine the number of full-time employees, including full-time equivalents, for the prior measurement period. Under the first one, it was 120 hours a month. On this test, it's 130 hours per month. Step two, determine the monthly average of full-time equivalents for the preceding year. Here, you look at who works less than 30 hours per week or 130 hours per month. Calculate the total hours worked each month during the preceding year by part-time employees. Divide the total hours by 120 and then divide by 12. Yes, they cannot decide between 130 and 120. So in one part of the test you're using 130 and in another part you're using 120. Again, we've got the six month period for 2013. So you with me? Step one, you determine full-time employees. Step two, you determine full-time equivalents. Okay? You hanging in there? The rules actually tell you. The rules tell you. The 120 is used in the first test. 
and then in this test use 130 for the calculation and then use 120 for the but there's a worksheet that we go through to do this okay step three determine the total monthly average number of employees and again here facts, fractions are disregarded so 49.9 equals 49 everything rounds down it could be 49.9999 it's not 50 everything rounds down then step four you determine your employer status if the total in step three and again step three is taking the full-time employees from step one the full-time employees from step two and adding them together that's step three Step four, if the total is less than 50, stop. You're not a large employer and you're not subject to the penalties. If the total in step three is 50 or more, then you are a large employer and subject to the pay or play penalties. Let me stop there. Any questions before we go on? If you'll notice, I still got a lot of slides left and they're not getting easier. They're going to get harder. Okay. You asked for it. Here is a rule that's probably going to affect a lot of people in this room, a lot of people in the Branson Hollister area. This is the seasonal employee rule. The seasonal employee exclusion is to allow the employer to exclude seasonal employees from the large employer status if two calculations are met. One of the reasons I actually contacted Deborah and Randall early on was to say that after the last session I talked with several others here and realized this is a rule that's critical for this area because of the major industries that are here. And you've probably heard about the seasonal employee exclusion and are thinking, hey, this is really going to help us out. When you see the actual exclusion, it's probably not going to help you out very much because it's so limited. Why is that? Your season is longer than the seasons that this is aimed after. The seasons that this is really aimed after are pure old mall retail where they hire up for 60 days you know, for the Christmas season. Uh, they'll fit within this rule. Most of the folks in this part of the country will not, and let me show you why. Two conditions. The employer's workforce exceeds 50 full-time employees, including seasonals, for no more than four calendar months. Your season down here is a lot longer than four calendar months. And from what I understand, basically you have what? two or three months off that are kind of slow, January, February, was it Denver, January, February, March, part of March. So you've got somewhere between nine and ten active seasons to get more active. But if your seasonal employees basically work four months or less, then the seasonal employee exclusion will help you. Let me show you how it works just in case that maybe some of you are hiring up, you know, during this. So the employee's workforce exceeds full-time employees for no more than four calendar months, the equivalent of 120 days. The employee and the employees in excess of 50 during those months are seasonal employees. What that means is during that calculation, you've got 40, let's say, full-time employees and 30 full-time equivalents, okay? So for a total under step three above of 70. But without the seasonals that constitute the equivalents, you're below 50. It's the seasonals that put you above 50. So the exclusion says if it's the seasonals that put you above 50, then you can potentially use this exclusion. I told you it's going to get nasty. It's only going to get worse for the next hour. I got to warn you. We're going to get these rules are going to get crazier and crazier. So this is a seasonal employee exclusion. Do you see what it's doing now? In that example again, you've got 40 true full times, and then at your hotel or whatever, 
you've got a whole bunch of seasonals that are here for a period and they add up to 30 full-time equivalents. They put you over the 50, making you a large employer. This rule can come in and said maybe or not. So if you do that, and if the result is less than 50, you're not a large employer. If the result is more than 50, and the seasonal workers do not cause the more than 50 result, you are a large employer and subject to the penalties. Okay? So that's the seasonal employee exclusion. If you're under 50 with your full times, but the seasonals put you over the top, you can take them off for the calculation, but remember seasonals are limited to only the four months. There is a transition relief thing, and we've talked about this a bunch. This is a six-month rule for the first year of compliance. The employer can choose any consecutive six-month period in 2013. Why did they say you can choose any? Because some might be looking at this. Uh, you know, I, I told you about the three periods. You don't have to use all three periods. So as we get into those periods, that will make a little more sense. 2014 and after you must use the entire calendar year for the factoring. For looking at 2013 for 2014, you can use a six-month period. After that, you use the entire period beforehand. Okay? Next, who are your full-time employees? The pay or play penalties are either triggered by the total number of full-time employees or applicable to those full-time employees who are adversely affected. And we're going to get into what all that means. Make sure none of these are the ones I have extra notes on. So who's a full-time employee? And remember, for purposes of determining this, if you have 50 employees, use the test. To determine if you have 50, use the test we already talked about. For a non-variable hour employee, and there are different types of classification, an employee is hired as a full-time employee if they're hired 30 hours a week or 130 hours per month. Okay? That is, again, on average. So it might be some weeks they're 35, some weeks they're 25. But is it 30 hours a week or 130 hours per month? When you hire a new employee, you have to make a good faith, reasonable interpretation. Are they being hired as a full-time or part-time employee? The idea is you can't just hire everybody as part-time and then come to the end of the period and say, oh yeah, they were all such good employees, we let them work full-time. But since we only do the calculation once a year, we didn't know that when we hired them. Sorry we didn't cover them, but we well, have to make a reasonable good faith interpretation. And so if you say they're part-time, but immediately you're paying them on a full-time basis, HHS or DOL is going to come back and say that wasn't accurate. Once they're hired, they have, you have 90 days to enroll them in the plan. Now, that rule is in actually two places of PPACA. One is uh, long before these rules, that was just what we called the new waiting period rule. There is a trick to that. Most plans today are worded that if you start on uh, January 15th, it will say something like, you're entitled to be covered under the plan on the first day following 90 days of employment, right? I mean, that's pretty common. Not anymore, not under this rule. It is after 90 days. So if you're hired January 15th, you're eligible for coverage April 15th. When does that go into effect? 2014. 2014. Uh-huh. So, again, it's not the first day of the month following 90. It's the first day of the month. Or, no, it, it is 90 days after employment. No first day of the month rule. If you want to do the first day of the month rule, then you're going to have to say first day of the month following 60 days of employment. It's about the only way that's going to work to fit within the 90. So the waiting period cannot be more than 90 days. Now, if you're in a big union plan, that's not a big deal because they do enrollments daily. They're used to that. But most of you probably aren't. Um, so with most plans, you're going to have to manipulate and not be able to use the full 90 days. Uh, okay, I covered all that. 
ongoing employees. Now we get into the periods again. The measurement period for ongoing employees can be a period um, of look back chosen by the employer. It can be the calendar year or any 12 month period. And this kind of gets to your question that you had, you know, that do I have to use a calendar year if I've got a May 1 plan renewal? No, you can use any 12 month period you want. If the employee averages 30 hours during the measurement period, the employee counts as a full-time employee. So this is ongoing. What this means is, oh, let me just not do that yet. Where am I here? These are the variable hour employees. For the ongoing employees, then you have a stability period. The stability period follows the measurement period. If the employee is deemed to be a full-time employee during the measurement period, you must treat them as a full-time employee during the stability period and offer them coverage. And again now, this is where I get to that rule I mentioned before. This calculation is made once a year in most scenarios. So the stability period must be at least six months long or if greater the length of the measurement period. Most people will be using a 12-month measurement period, which means the stability period will be 12 months. So again, if that person is deemed to be a full-time employee during the measurement period, they will be deemed to be a full-time employee through the entire stability period, regardless of whether there's a layoff or reduction of hours. So if they're deemed to be an employee, a full-time employee during the 2013 measurement period, in 2014 they're on the plan and working 35 hours a week and it's a bad summer, weather, whatever, and you reduce them down from 35 to 20 for a period of time. Even though they're only working 20, they're still a full-time employee because on that annual calculation, they're a full-time employee. Okay? I don't know if so, it's okay, but yeah. So every year for the variable employees, you can look back whatever period of time you want to look back? Yeah, and basically you're, we're going to see in just a couple of slides here, for new employees there are going to be rolling periods, for your ongoing employees it's going to be the same period every year. And I'll explain that just a bit. So you'll, their first year of employment you'll have overlapping periods. In most examples, I know you're on, not on the calendar year, most of my examples are going to be calendar year, but just because it's easier. You're also permitted to have an administrative period between the measurement period and the stability period, which can be up to 90 days. That, again, works with the 90-day waiting period rule. I will tell you that most of my clients, I'm curious what the Connell folks are seeing, most of my clients aren't messing with the administrative period just because it makes the calculations even more difficult. What are you all seeing in that? Same thing? just not messing with it. So basically what that could mean is that, and I think the next slide may be an example. Yeah. Let's say the measurement period that you chose is October 15th, year one, through October 14th, year two. You could then have an administrative period, which could be at least 90 days. Here we're choosing 75 days, October 15th through December. And the stability period would be January 1 through December 31. So the measurement period here, is a 12-month period. The administrative period is a 75-day um, period for this person, and the stability period is a one year because it has to be at least as long as the measurement period. It's just an example of that. 2014 relief, again, once again, allows employers to adopt a shorter measurement period of six months, but keep a longer stability period of 12 months. This is what most employers will do for next year, is have a six-month measurement period and a 12-month stability period. The measurement period must be at least six months, begin no later than July 1, and end no earlier than 90 days before the first day of the plan year beginning, on or after 1-1 of 14. Transition relief example here, we got a measurement period of 4-1-13 through 9-31-13, there's a typo here. The administrative period would be 10-113, not 1-113. If 
you don't make that change on there, you're going to get back and think I am completely crazy. So please make that change. Okay. So the measurement period is six-month period from April through September. The administrative period is January, uh, is, is September, uh, October through December. And the stability period will be the 12 months of 2014. Just another example showing how that works. All right. Those are your ongoing employees. Now, oh, let me tell you one more thing on this. Um, one of the things that we're starting to see a lot right now is, and it's not just for these rules, um, but the, and this is stuff I really talked about in November. And at that point, I said, I referred to 2014 as the seismic shift. It's kind of my phrase. It's when the big changes in PPAC are come about. And those changes start for the first year, plan year, beginning 1-1 one, one or after. So like if you're a May 1, then those changes kick in in May. What we're seeing a number of groups doing right now is coming in and saying, well, we're a 1-1 one -one renewal. But in order to postpone the changes, we're going to do an early plan year shift. So take what would have been a 1231 and turn it into a 1031 so that the PPACA requirements won't apply to us until November 1 of 2014 instead of January 1 of 2014. So that's something we're just starting to see some folks. I've started seeing that much here, people talking about that. Yeah. So taking, making this 2013 year to be a short year and then starting a new year, either like November, October, November, December, something like that. Does that work? Probably. Are there potential problems with it? Yeah. Number one, your employees are going to hate it. If you have a CAF plan, that's really going to mess with the CAF plan, right? Because the CAF plan's on an annual basis. Um, the employees aren't going to like it, for example, if they've already met their annual deductible or out of pocket and they thought they were good for November and December, and now you just started a new plan year, November 1, and they start a new deductible, and they're going to think they didn't get the benefit of their 12-month deductible and out-of-pocket. Um, can you carry over the deductible? Maybe. But if you do that, I could see the DOL or HHS coming in and saying, well, if you're carrying over the deductible and the out-of-pocket, then you really didn't change your plan year. So your plan's out of compliance because you're really still 1-1 one, one instead of 11-1. Um, so you've got all that. Then another problem with that, and this is a concept I'm going to start bringing up more for the remainder of our time here. In November, I talked about the 105H non-discrimination rules will be applicable to fully insured plans. 105H was a section of code, is a section of code that has very strict non-discrimination rules on self-funded plans. Historically, if a plan was discriminatory, they went fully insured instead of self-funded because you can discriminate more under state insurance law than you can under federal non-discrimination law for self-funded plans. So let's use my example and say we move it from 1-1 to 11-1 and let's say there are some employees who are hurt by that because they've used up their deductible and they're out of pocket. And there are other employees who haven't. If the employees that are hurt are the lower paid employees and you make that change, you have a potential discrimination issue, which could result in some penalties. So is that an effective strategy? It can be. But don't do it without talking to the Connell people first 
Deborah wants to get lots of these questions, I know, and Tim and Randall and everybody. Um, if it's a really tricky thing, they'll call me because that's what we do. We work together. So if that's something you're considering, don't just kind of do it on your own. Make sure that you really think it through and look to see if you've got other potential problems. Um, I will say if you do it, you're going to have very unhappy employees. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying look at all the possible ramifications of it. All right, new hires. New hires have basically the same rule with some tweaks. The first tweak is this. Their first measurement period begins the day they start work. So I've got, well, and let me say this, let me go through these rules first. The first measurement period is their first year of service. The second measurement period is the employer's normal measurement period. So if they start April 15th, then their first measurement period is April 15th to April 14th. Their second measurement period is, say, their calendar year plan, January 1 to 1231. So their first and second measurement periods overlap. You see that? So for the first measurement period, it's April 15 to April 14. For the second measurement period, you back up to January 1 because they're put into the employer's normal measurement period. Now, we've got a client we're doing some stuff with right now and it's a Missouri client here, they are averaging 15 new employees per week. They are literally going to have 365 different measurement periods every year at this growth cycle that they're having. What industry are they I can't say. Financial, I'll say that much. Financial. Uh-huh. Not yours. <laughs> um, but they are growing at just a crazy level, and this rule is going to be a nightmare. They're literally going to have 365 different measurement periods every year. The administrative period measurement period cannot extend beyond the last day of the first calendar month beginning after their one year anniversary and then the stability period at least six months in the same. And that's just the same rule as we have for the others. But the key here is with the new hires that um, their first measurement period is their first year of employment. And then the second measurement period falls back to whatever the plan year is. All right. At the government level? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I will get into that. It's so primarily going to be HHS. It will also be the exchange itself and the State Department of Insurance and possibly the Department of Labor. And I'm going to get into the DOL issue in a little bit. And the DOL has experience in this. And I will get to this a little later on. What we're talking about seems very new to us on the health side. This actually is not a new concept. On the pension side, the DOL has been doing this for years, for decades, ever since ERISA came out. Uh, the rules are a little different, but they kind of have the same results. All right. Any school districts in the room? Okay. I get to skip a few slides. I will tell you, any of you on school boards, <laughs> um, basically the school district rule let me just tell you the basic feature of it and I left those slides in because in November I know we had several school districts in the room didn't know if they were going to show up or not think about a teacher a teacher works nine months unless they teach summer school the rule for schools says 
that you look at their average, and I'm going to use, make the numbers easy, you look at their average number of hours during the school year, during those nine months, and you give them that same average number for each month of the summer. So if they're averaging 130 hours a month during the school year, you give them 130 hours for three months over the summer, which gives them 390 additional hours and helps them become a full-time employee. It takes about 100 pages to say that, but that's basically what the rule is. What are the penalties? There are two penalties for large employers. The first penalty is the no coverage penalty. This means that the employer does not provide any health coverage to their employees. Not going to be anyone in this room. Um, the second penalty is what's called the unaffordable coverage penalty. Um, I refer to them as the no coverage penalty and the crappy coverage penalty. They have coverage, but it's crappy. I mean, it's really lousy coverage and it's unaffordable or it doesn't meet some of the other rules. So these are the two penalties. Yeah. Kind of. I'm going to tell you what we know so far. It is, but we don't have the full set of regs yet. I will tell you what we know so far and what I think it will be. Okay? Um, but again, it's one where you're going to have to stay tuned because we don't have the final, final words on that yet. Um, in order to trigger a penalty, at least one full-time employee must qualify for a tax credit, which I talked about above, or a subsidy, which is income-based. Here is the tax credit and subsidy. For income between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level. For 2012, that's 11,170 single, 23,050 family, 400% uh, is 44,680, and 92,900. This is the number you're going to know. It's your employee's W-2. So it's a graded credit slash subsidy between 100 and 400 percent. There are two disqualifiers. Number one, the employer offers affordable minimum value coverage, and that's the test we'll get into. Number two, the employer coverage is not affordable, but the employee enrolls in it anyway. Uh, affordability is defined, and we're going to get into what that is. But this proviso or disqualifier says they don't get the subsidy if the employer offers affordable coverage or the employer offers coverage that's not affordable, but the employee enrolls anyway. And um, this little deal here has got some national folks uh, concocting plans that I'm not very comfortable with. And I'll explain that as we get into it a little more. For non-calendar year plans, uh, there's a particular relief provision. For any employee eligible to participate um, in the plan under the eligibility, and I'm actually going to have more notes now, so I'm going to grab my pad here because we're getting way into the weeds now. Under the eligibility terms, as, as of 12, 17, 12, um, the employer is not subject to pay or play until the first day of the plan year starting in 14. doesn't matter whether the employee actually takes coverage. As of the first day of the 2014 plan year, the employer must offer coverage as affordable and minimum value. So these are non-calendar year plans for those eligible as of 12, 27, 12. And the key word is eligible, whether they're on or not. For employers not subject to the pay or play penalty for any full-time employee until 1114, the non-calendar year plan has to have been offered to at least one-third of the employer's employees or the most recent open enrollment, or the non-calendar year plan covered at least one-quarter of the employees. So this is a weird little rule, and you can look at any date between 1231-12 or 1031-12 and 1227-12. I'm not going to go into this one in a great deal of detail. If you're a non-calendar year plan, this provides a little bit of relief for the first 
year. Let's look at the basic penalties now. First off, we have the no coverage penalty. This says that the employer does not offer what we call minimum essential coverage, MEC, or MEC. Minimum essential coverage to all full-time employees, and here's a, lot, a rule a lot of people aren't aware of, and their dependent children. Okay? So the coverage has to be offered to employees and their children. Who's not listed there? The spouse. You don't have to offer it to the spouse. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Future audiences are going to hear that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, you, you, do not have, you have to offer it to the employees and their dependent children. I guess the idea of the spouse can work if they need. The penalty... Oh yeah. Now, but I'm going to get to that okay. because it's the calculation is just the employee cost, okay. not dependent cost. Okay. You, have to offer <laughs> you have to offer it, but it's not in that calculation. Okay. Yep, not in the calculation. And in fact, you're going well. I'll tease you with this other rule later. There's a really biz couple. There are a couple of bizarre rules coming. <laughs> You'll see it in a little bit. You'll see it in a little bit. And I. It's a loophole theory that there are some that are publicizing it widely. You know, I, I got to get through some more rules before it'll make sense to you. But the problem is, if you come up with a loophole and you talk a lot about the way around it, and you start writing articles on it, what these folks don't realize is that HHS and IRS subscribe to those same magazines, and they'll say, "Aha! We need to close that loophole." So, does it work technically? Will it work in six months? Probably not, because they'll close it up. Okay, no coverage penalty is $2,000 per employee. This is what I refer to as a sledgehammer penalty. It applies to all the employees, and I don't know why, above 30. You get 30 freebies. Um, so the penalty, if you've got 100 employees and you have no coverage, you'll pay the penalty on 70. You can not offer coverage to 30 and, and not have a penalty. At least one of the employees must receive a premium tax credit, and the employer will receive a notice of the employee subsidy with the right to appeal. The way that works is, in most of these, in these cases, is that the employee goes out and buys it on the exchange. When they buy it on the exchange, the exchange will ask, do you have coverage from your employer? Do you have an employer? And they get the employer's name and then the exchange notifies the employer of the subsidy and that you may will be subject to the penalty. There is a 95% coverage rule and this rule says that the $2,000 employee penalty will apply unless coverage is offered to at least 95% of all full-time employees. Now, this gets us into a critical distinction. To determine if you're a large employer, we add the number of full-time employees plus full-time equivalents, right? The penalty only applies to full-time employees, not to full-time equivalents. So you add them in for determining if you're a large employer, but you take them out for the penalty calculation. If less than 95% are covered, you pay the penalty for all minus the 30. Um, an example is that, say, a class employees are excluded, such as certain hourly workers. You'll pay a penalty for all full-time employee if that class exceeds 5% of all the employees. And then again, we put here, you must offer to the dependents. Now, the employee coverage 
must be affordable. The dependent coverage need not be affordable. The affordability test does not relate to the dependent coverage. So an employer could technically rate up that dependent coverage to a very high level. If the coverage is offered to all full-time employees, then you say, is the coverage affordable and does it provide minimum value? If the answer is no, then you're subject to the unaffordability coverage penalty. So the coverage is available, but is it affordable and does it provide minimum value? If it's either not affordable or not minimum value, then the penalty is $3,000 per full-time employee who's affected. Under the no coverage penalty, the penalty applies to all full-time employees less 30, right? Sledgehammer penalty applies to everybody. This is an ice pick penalty. It only applies to those for whom uh, it's not affordable or doesn't provide minimum value, and they go on to the exchange. Okay. The 30 employee credit does not apply. The 30 employee credit only applies to the no coverage penalty, not to the affordability, unaffordability penalty. So the penalty is $3,000 per full-time employee who's affected and receives a premium tax credit for going on to the exchange. Here's how the affordability works. The employees share the premium for self-only coverage. This is the employee's share cannot exceed 9.5% of the employee's income. So even though statute said household income, the regs have changed that to employee income because that's what you know. Now, again, the employees don't want to tell you that. So if the employee earns 30000 a year, 2500 per month, their share of the premium may not exceed $237.50 per month. in guidance. I mean, they can't overrule the statute, but what they said, here's how we're going to interpret the statute. So, um, if you employ two employees, you're using the 4070 income that they turn in, you know, you... Right. Generally, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the affordability key here, it's two keys. 9.5% of the employee's income, and it's their share. Like I did this seminar, and I got this 237, and somebody raised their hand angrily, oh, you can't even buy terrible coverage for $237. Now, we're not talking about the employee premium. It's the employee share of the premium. So if it's 50-50, then you're talking about you know $470 a month of premium. Three affordability safe harbors. This kind of gets to your question. W-2 income, uh, rate of pay, uh, and then the federal poverty level. These are how we look at the affordability issue. Let's see here. All right, minimum value test. So under affordable, under the, the unaffordable coverage, that's kind of a misnomer because there are two ways that you can make this second penalty. One is the coverage is unaffordable. Second is that the coverage has, does not meet the level of minimum value. Minimum value means the plan must pay for at least 60% of the covered benefit. In essence, that's a bronze plan. Uh, meaning the covered person is responsible for no more than 40% of the cost. Um, we do not have any regs on this at this point. All we have, um, and there are all sorts of different guidances that we're receiving now. The highest level of guidance, other than the statute, which a lot of people are saying, hey, we need to get this fixed by statute. Not going to happen this Congress will never be able to agree to a fix, okay? So it's going to have to come through regs, and that's the highest level of guidance. Then there's other sorts of guidances that are coming out in terms of guidance letters, FAQs, frequently asked questions. 
websites. When PPACA first came out, there was some information on the website that wasn't really a reg and gave us some real high-level guidance. But in order to determine 60%, there are three methods. Number one is the minimum value calculator. And that just came out with, uh, out of HHS some new regs last week that started looking at the minimum value calculator. Number two is a design-based safe harbor checklist. Again, we've gotten only preliminary guidance. That checklist has four key categories, physician services, hospital, emergency room, prescription drug, and lab. And then the third is an actuarial certification um, that the plan meets the 60% uh, requirement. We will be getting more guidance on this. Until then, we've just got to look at, does your plan have a true 60% or better benefit? If it does, you're probably going to be okay. Um, but again, we'll have more as, as we get closer in. And next slide, I'm going to tell you about this strategy. Um, the penalty itself applies to full-time employees. You have to do an employee-by-employee -employee determination to see if the premium is more than 9.5%. So for your higher-paid employees, it won't be. Maybe for some of your lower-paid, it could be. And again, this is an ice pick penalty. So the penalty only applies to those who are actually affected by it. The employee must receive the, penalty, the premium tax credit or subsidy and the employee must not have enrolled in the employer plan. Even if it's not affordable, if the employee enrolls, they lose out on the credit and subsidy. So this strategy that's going on out there, I'll be interested in, in the Connell period of seed, people have seen this down here yet, is that, um, now let me, I got another slide I want to do before I get to it, and I'll be right back to it. This next slide gets to common control. A lot of employers own more than one subsidiary. So you might have a holding company or a parent company with various subsidiaries underneath. So the question is, do we test the group on an aggregated basis or do we look at each subsidiary or brother-sister corporation on their own. When determining a large employer status, all employees of related employers are counted together. So let's just use an example that you own a hotel and a restaurant that's either in or adjacent to the hotel, and they're right next door to each other, but they're separate companies. They would be looked at together for determining if they're a large employer. But under the pay or play penalty, you look to each employer separately, at least at this time. At least at this time. Because there's a lot of discussion about this of employers need to break up into multiple small entities. And I think, again, if that happens, we're going to see a regulatory fix against it. Right. What if we just simply said, you know, all of our part time workforce that could not play over 30, under 30, you know, hard to keep track of it, uh, are now contracted? Yeah, the rules at this point don't really get into that. Um, the general tax rules and ERISA rules we have do. And the, I, the thought is going to be that those rules are going to apply. Um, there was a case uh, it was probably eight or ten years ago now, maybe not quite that long, seven or eight years ago, and it was called Microsoft versus Viscano. 
and it's a really key case, probably for your industry. Uh, and what happened there was Microsoft had a lot of its own employees, but they also then took some employees from a staffing agency. And those folks worked at Microsoft right next to Microsoft employees. One of the rules under employee leasing is that the staffing agency has to have a pension plan. And this is a pension case, not a health case. And you'll see why in just a moment. But you can't put everybody into this staffing agency that doesn't have a pension plan, whereas the real employer has a pension plan. So in this case, the staffing agency had a pension plan. But these folks are working right in the cubicle right next to Microsoft folks. So when they're at the water cooler, and this was in the 90s, right? They're at the water cooler, and they're hearing the Microsoft guys talk about their stock, and their plan is going crazy. And the leased workers are saying, I'm in this cruddy plan through my leasing company that has no Microsoft stock. You know, and their stock's are growing at 60% a year, and the leasing folks are at 5 or 6% a year. Well, those employees sued Microsoft, saying, we're really not a leased employee, we're really a Microsoft employee. And then there's the 13-factor test that you look at and all that. Well, and the court did something crazy uh, at the time and just threw everybody in a tizzy. Because what they said was, those employees are an employee of the leasing company, but they're also an employee of Microsoft and Microsoft had to retroactively put all those employees into their pension plan. Now, I bring that up because we have no rules on the question you're asking about these other companies. We have no rules under health care reform. But we do have long-standing rules that all of us who are watching this are saying, are they going to pull this over to health care reform? It would be pretty easy to do. So... Don't feel great comfort in it yet. <laughs> Maybe, but don't feel great comfort in it yet. All right, here's an example. Uh, one employer, Acme, does not have coverage. Only Acme and the other employers in the group will be subject. Did I skip? Yeah, to the pay or play penalty. Um, the 30 point credit is prorated based upon the ratio of Acme's workforce to the total workforce of the group. If the group has 50 employees and ACME has, it's 500 and ACME has 50, ACME gets a 3% employee credit, which is 10% of the 30. So that's how the controlled group works now. All right. Let's look at some employer options, and we're about to wind up. One of the tricks that I've seen before I go in there is that the employer would offer all the low paid employees two plans. One of those plans would have all the minimum essential coverage and be very expensive for the employees so that the employees would not take the coverage. The second plan would be what we used to call a mini-med, which is a plan that's very basic. It often doesn't provide for doctor visits, and it provides a limited benefit if you're in the hospital. I mean, it's a really, really scaled-down plan, but offer that really cheap. So the idea would be that they're meeting the minimum, the minimum affordable coverage under the plan that the lower paid employees can't afford, but they're offering the mini-med at such a cheap level that the employees take it. Remember I said to have the employee receive the subsidy, they can't enroll in the employer plan even if it's unaffordable. So these employees would take this plan that doesn't meet the minimum requirements, but it's so cheap, they opted out of the subsidy. Okay, you see, that's a little edgy. I mean, I, and they're talking about a lot, I think it's gonna come along that, um, 
I, I think the regulators will slap against that at some point, and I can see how it could be done. Uh, but it is there, and that is one of the things going on. Okay, what are the employer options? If employer currently has no coverage, they can either start offering coverage or not offer coverage and pay the penalty. You'll factor in the employee credit. I point out there have been a couple of tax issues. The penalty is not deductible. It's an excise tax. It's not deductible, so there's no tax benefit for it. Um, you could have coverage, but some full-time employees are not eligible. Uh, then you, if you're falling below the 95% test, then you probably need to start bumping it up to avoid the penalty. Second op set of options. So you have coverage, but it's not affordable because the employee share is greater than 9.5%. What are your options there? Number one, increase, increase the employer's portion. In other words, to get the employee share below the 9.5%. Number two, maybe the plan's too rich. So you need to go from an 80% plan down to a 60% plan to lower the premium and make it affordable. Number three, reduce the employee share of the premium and increase the employer share, uh, but also reduce wages. Next, factor in the likelihood of employees who will qualify for the subsidy and do a calculation, say, is it worth it? Factor in employees who will not participate in the exchange because they have an employer plan that's not affordable. Or a topic which has been gaining some steam uh, is to have reverse discrimination. And that means the more you make, the more you pay toward your coverage. Uh, a number of employers have done this recently nationally. Um, I think they did it for the PR value, which they got some good PR out of it. But what you could do is that the employee share is higher the more you make. And there's no problem with the risk of it. it. Because you can discriminate against the owners all you want. You just can't discriminate against the lower paids. So you can discriminate against the higher paids all you want, and DOL will love you for it. Because they don't like the higher paids. If you have coverage but it fails the minimum value test, you can increase the benefits and the employer premium. You can increase the benefits but make the employer absorb some additional costs but not above 9.5%. You can keep your full-time employee level before 50 or keep the number of full-time employees as limited as possible. Um, and you could restructure the part-time employee hours. Let me make one point on this. One of the strategies that I'm hearing a lot is, boy, we're just barely over that. We need to take our employees who are working 30 hours a week average and push them down to 25. The problem with the, I mean, and, and that would seem like an answer based upon the rules as they're written. Again, on the pension side where we have history, the DOL has come in and attacked that strategy, saying, we see what's going on. You had them above 30 until the penalties kicked in, all of a sudden they're working less than 30. So we're going to say that that's improper and you're manipulating their hours and try and bring in some penalties or such. The similar thing is, if you have employees that are below that 30, then keep them below that 30. You know, because if they go up, then you're subjecting yourself to more penalties. As to whether you take those that are working more than 30 and push them down below 30, there's a little more risk in that. At this point, a number of folks have asked the DOL if they're going to use that pension compliance tool on the health care reform side, and the DOL has refused to answer, which means they're thinking about it. So just beware that that could become an issue. All right, closing thoughts, then we'll open it up for questions. It's a big year ahead um, in our own firm. We had quite an amazing January and February in terms of how busy we've been. And I had a, we had a staff meeting today, and I looked at everybody, and I said, I just want you to remember, 
January is always our slowest month of the year because so many plans renew at the end of December. And so January is usually kind of quiet. You got all the plan changes and finance changes and everything. And we had this like just killer January. And I said, well, made it through the easiest month of this year. I mean, it's just going to be a crazy year. Now, a lot of these things are scheduled for 2014. Do not take this to the bank. I think we're going to see some extensions of time because I simply think that there's not enough time left. And I'm watching this every single day. Now, the regulators at this point will not admit that. Uh, they're asking them, and you saw that quote at the beginning, of course we'll be ready. I don't believe it. We're going to be getting new guidance. Hopefully they'll slow down on the 500 pages a week thing, but we'll be getting new guidance. Stay tuned for more detail. And then, um, again, what I've told you is good and true as of today. Uh, last week I gave a talk and got in my car to head back. It was actually out of town. Uh, but I got on the plane, or got to the airport to get on the plane to fly back to Kansas City after, and I was teaching down in Texas for a client, kind of like Connell, down in the Texas area. As I was in the airport, looking on my tablet, the rules I had just told them, there was a new set of regs, which uh, changed four or five of the things that I had told my audience a few hours before. That's what's going on right now. So with that, I will open it up to your questions and take it from there. What, what was your controversial strategy and your the on the deductible? Yeah, the controversial strategy was that one where you offer a plan that's minimum essential coverage with a high premium and a junkie plan at a low premium that you're trying to force them, and there, it even gets worse. You're trying to force them into the junk plan. Well, they're not well, they will because it's affordable. It's like really cheap. And the other thing that I've seen some add to this now is that other parts of PPACA allow you to do up to a 30% penalty if people don't participate in wellness. So you take the minimum essential coverage and you do it at a high cost so it doesn't meet the affordability and you add on penalties for not doing wellness, which those penalties are designed to drive the sick people from the more expensive plan into the piece of junk plan. I don't think that strategy is going to... Is it technically compliant as of today? Maybe. Will it be compliant by the time we get to the end of the year? I don't think so. Um, I even waver on whether it's technically correct today because I think in that the IRS could come in and say, huh, all the higher paid people are in the good plan. All the lower paid people are in the trashy plan. And that's discrimination. I know. So I'm just making a point by calling it that. No, I completely understand. Can you, can you keep the basic plan? So there's nothing in the PACA that says you cannot. Keep As the of uh, 1109 so on this date. That's the reason why you have to have the basic plan, because you can't meet participation. Right, the 95%. Yeah. So no, and I, I, I understand. Mm -hmm. Whenever you still have a large... Well, and I, I, I personally think what's going to happen, and it may not even be this year, it may be next year, they're going to come in and say, those who are in a plan that is not a MEC, minimum essential coverage, do not count as being covered. Now, it may take a year or two to get there, but I just think there's danger in that arrangement. The deductible, um, the MEC rule requires at least 60% of the coinsurance. There's no deductible rule at this point. 
other than the uh, maximum deductible rules under the insurance market rules, you know, which are basically tied to the maximum HSA point. So you're only saying 60% uh, coinsurance. Coinsurance, not 60% premium. Right. Sixty mm-hmm. percent of the it's a sixty percent benefit, not premium. Gotcha. Okay. okay. All right. How about the rest of you? I did take a seat, but that doesn't mean I'm done. Just means my feet got tired. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, what have you raised the deductible to at this point? Which you're probably okay because that's within, you're probably going to be all right with that at this point. <laughs> oh, we, that's a great question because that sketchy design, you know, plays into that. We don't have guidance. What our question was, does the 9.5% factor in wellness incentive penalties? We have no answer on that yet. Um, But my supposition will be that that's an employee cost that will go toward that. Now, one of the things in PPACA is that it was originally a 20% penalty. Sibelius has the authority, had the authority to move it to 30, which she's done, and also has the authority to increase that all the way to 50 in later years, which if you're trying to incent wellness, 50% is going to do it. I mean, 30% is a pretty good hit. 50% is really going to do it. Okay. Um, we all are. Uh, <laughs> there is much discussion about that right now. Uh, the rules are not completely clear. Um, I did not put that in my slides today. I probably should have. I can send you some information on what we have at this point because we've got a white paper on it. It's pretty complicated, but. Yeah, you were talking about tips. Are you in hospitality or? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. And you're already keeping them under that. So they can get the Medicaid. Yeah, yeah, which helps you on the other side too. Yeah. Um, typically, the non-citizens do not. Um, now, these are student visas, you said? We have some students there from their There are, in fact, I'm doing a talk ooh, later this month. I better get on those slides. Um, I'm doing a talk on uh, the health care reform rules as relates to student health insurance. There are a lot of new rules on student health that are really going to change how that's going to work. So uh, basically, uh, student health insurance is being taken out of the larger market. It's it's going to be viewed on its own and not a part of the individual market. Are you with the college here? or? No. Uh, we basically hire them. Oh, okay. Right. Right. Okay, I just thought that's maybe why you're concerned because you're with the college nearby here. So hospitality also then. See, this is, um, <coughs> again, after the November talk, I talked with Connell and some others about this and realized, well, I think Deborah and I were talking, like, this is a really key topic for Branson. Is, you know, Branson and Orlando and Vegas and 
Um, maybe we should have had this in Vegas. You know? <laughs> we'll do that next time. <laughs> Other questions? I just want to make sure I'm clear on um, the If you're clear on it, then you're not reading deep enough. Yeah. Yeah, affordability test. Right. So we have a lot of employees that would fall below that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there and I put on that slide is maybe two or three from the end different strategies. Um, what I would caution is those are kind of general strategies. Um, your own strategy is going to be very fact-based. That you know, don't just do it off the basis of that one slide. You know, get with Tim or Deborah or Randall and and walk through it to you know make sure we're looking at all the tests on that. Yes, absolutely. Uh huh. Right. I think, and I think we're going to be seeing more, more and more of that. And again, the White House would love that. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's helping people get this coverage. Yeah, there is. There's a huge issue. Um, and I didn't go. I, I I told you what those private exchanges are. Uh, there are some designs out there, and I'm seeing a bunch of them that have real problems um, because they're using an HRA to pay out the money to the employees to go buy coverage as individual coverage. The problem is uh, we got guidance, which is exactly what we expected, that if you give employees money to go buy individual coverage, the HRA and the premium, and the, the HRA and the individual policy cannot be used to satisfy minimum coverage. If you give them money to buy a group policy, it can work, but individual policy can't. So the employer would be giving them money to buy an individual policy and still pay the premium for not providing coverage because individual policies are not employer group health plans. I'm sorry, I had a hard time saying that, but the last sentence I think got me to say it as easy as possible, that if you pay for them to buy individual coverage, you could still pay the no coverage penalty because individual coverage is not an employer plan. So that strategy doesn't work very well. I just... <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs>
still don't know what I was waiting for. And my time was running wild, a million dead in street. And every time I thought I had coverage, it seemed the premium was just too steep. So I turned myself to the exchange, but I got so confused. And this navigator tried to help me. She sounds like a broker, but she's not. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, you want to be in a plan. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, I'm going to be an insured man. I found coverage on the exchange. I read about all the plan designs, but never understood all the differences. And as the words on the SBC flew past my eyes, all the plans still seem the same. And this platinum is so expensive. And the gold, it's not much better. The silver and bronze are more like it. But I'm a young invincible. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, you want to be in a plan. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, I'm going to be an insured man. I found coverage on the exchange. As I wonder what to do, I find my governor hates the president. The state refuses to set one up. But look, here come the feds. So I will have an exchange, and I will have a plan. You see, it all works out in the end. Thank you. Justice Roberts. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, you want to be in a plan. XX exchanges, log into the exchange. Exchanges, I'm going to be an insured man. I found coverage on the 